Welcome to the Tim Booker book sharing channel. Like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our updates. Let's explore the world of books together. Today, I want to interpret a book for you called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. The author is the American writer Robert M. Persick. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you a few questions. In life, have you ever had a moment where you wanted to break free from the constraints of the present and embark on a spontaneous journey? While learning, have you ever struggled with how to deal with unexpected moments of mental shutdown? At work, have you ever pondered how to achieve a better state of harmony between people and things? When making choices, have you ever been torn between following the voice within and conforming to external expectations? Today, let's follow Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance on a spontaneous journey and explore the answers to these questions. This book was published in 1974, almost 50 years ago, but it has consistently ranked on bestseller lists in many countries, with global sales surpassing 10 million copies. It was even selected by Time magazine as one of the 20 most influential books of the 20th century. Although the book is well known, many people have not opened it themselves due to its thickness and challenging content. No worries, today we will spend half an hour together to open this book and see what it's all about. It is an autobiographical novel that follows the author, his son Chris, and friends, the Sutherland couple, on a motorcycle journey across a large part of the United States during a hot summer. Alongside the experiences of the journey, the author begins to organize his important philosophical reflections, or Zen thoughts, throughout his life. Many of these thoughts are discussed through the lens of motorcycle maintenance, hence the title Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Now, why has this book been a bestseller for decades and gained worldwide popularity? One important reason is that the philosophical questions it explores are timeless and relevant to people regardless of the era. Questions like how to overcome mental obstacles, how to do things well, and how to manage one's relationship with the external world are addressed. However, this is not a serious, professional philosophical treatise, but rather a reflection on the author's extensive philosophical thoughts in the first half of his life. It is an equal spiritual dialogue between the author and the reader. For decades, people from different times and regions have continuously extracted unique insights from this cross-temporal communication with the author. Some memorable quotes from the book are still occasionally referenced today, such as, what makes you calm is advanced craftsmanship, the opposite is low level, and living only for some future goal is shallow. The mountain is where life comes together, not the peak. There's also the famous line, if Buddha or Jesus were alive today, they'd be sitting next to the computer and gearbox practicing, just like they sat on the mountaintop and lotus seat. We'll discuss some of these later. Many celebrities are loyal fans of this book. NBA legendary coach Phil Jackson, during his time coaching the Chicago Bulls, gave each player a copy of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, hoping they would find their best athletic state through reading. Physicist Stephen Hawking said that some people compared his book, A Brief History of Time, with Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and he felt honored. He hoped that A Brief History of Time could also guide people to actively explore deeper wisdom and universal laws of life similar to Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Not only them, but many outstanding individuals in various fields have this book in their personal reading lists. Some rocket scientists and tech experts even consider it their bedside book and frequently recommend it to others. If there are books in the market that have become a form of cultural capital in terms of social interaction, then Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance is undoubtedly one of them. Today's interpretation will be divided into three lines, taking you deeper into understanding this book. The first line will explore outward, taking a physical and mental journey. Throughout this process, we will ride motorcycles with the author, cross the American continent, and feel the inspiration brought to him by this journey. The second line will inquire inward, engaging in a search for thought. In this process, we will discuss the philosophical concept that the author spent the most time exploring in this book, the concept of quality. The third line will combine the internal and external revealing the author's real-life experiences and showing how this journey helped him achieve self-discovery. Okay, so first, let's join the author in starting the motorcycle, embarking on this cross-country cycling journey across a large part of the United States. The author, along with his son Chris and friends the Sutherland couple, undertook this journey in 1968. By referring to the route map included in the book, we can understand that they started from Minnesota in the central north of the United States, traveled west to the western coast, then rode along the west coast to the south, all the way to San Francisco, California. The journey lasted 18 days and 17 nights. If their goal was simply to travel from Minnesota to San Francisco, they could have easily taken a plane or a car. However, the author believes that only by riding a motorcycle can you truly immerse yourself in the scenery, closely connecting with nature and experiencing the immersive impact. Along the way, they went wherever they pleased, speeding and anchoring, 
traveling on interstate highways and riding through rural roads, crossing vast forests and climbing snow-covered mountains, staying in regular hotels and experiencing outdoor camping. In the author's words, the journey itself is much more interesting than rushing to a specific destination. The author refers to this journey as a Chautauqua. What does Chautauqua mean? It was a new educational movement that emerged in the late 19th century in the United States, similar to outdoor experiential learning. While camping and traveling outdoors, people would organize educational assemblies, lectures, discussions, and more. The reason the author calls his journey a Chautauqua is because, during the trip, he occasionally engaged in discussions with his son that were enlightening, continually refining important philosophical thoughts that were significant to him. Many of these reflections were introduced through the scene of repairing motorcycles. For example, the author found that his views on repairing motorcycles differed significantly from his friend John Sutherland. When the motorcycle broke down, the author naturally sought the small toolbox and user manual that came with the motorcycle to fix it himself. On the other hand, John didn't enjoy fixing motorcycles himself. Moreover, it wasn't just motorcycles, even the leaking faucet at his house, he was unwilling to fix it. He tried once, failed, and gave up. Later, the author realized that the issue wasn't about motorcycles or faucets, it was about John and his wife's aversion to technology and inability to cope with the products of technology. Even in their paintings and photos, there was no scenery related to technology. The author discovered that, in John and his wife's view, these forces from technology were attempting to erase each individual's uniqueness, turning everyone into a homogeneous group. Therefore, they could only passively resist and escape into the countryside whenever they had the chance. This was also a significant reason for embarking on this motorcycle journey. However, the author believes that avoiding technology in this way is a form of self-deception. The problem is not with technology itself, but how people handle their relationship with technology. This leads us to the famous quote mentioned earlier. If Buddha or Jesus were alive today, they'd be sitting next to the computer and gearbox practicing just like they sat on the mountaintop and lotus seat. In other words, the relationship between humans and technology depends not on technology itself but on one's mindset. If your mind is stable, technology cannot disturb you. From a broader perspective, the motorcycle not only symbolizes science and technology but also represents more broadly all objective external existence. Therefore, many people believe that when the book discusses repairing motorcycles, it is not only exploring how humans interact with technology but also how to better unify subjectivity and objectivity and how to better handle the relationship between oneself and the external world. So, what are the results of the author's contemplation? Next, let's return to the scene of repairing the motorcycle, guided by the author, and open the doors of philosophical thoughts. First, let's talk about a scientific method mentioned in the book for problem solving, which is to alternate between two logical reasoning methods, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning starts from observing the motorcycle, then reaches a general conclusion. For example, they observed that the motorcycle stalled when encountering potholes on the road. Later, there was no stalling when riding on flat roads. After repeating this several times, they could reasonably infer that potholes were causing the engine to stall. This is known as inductive reasoning, drawing general principles from individual experiences. Deductive reasoning is the opposite. It derives specific results from general principles. For example, if you understand the structure of a motorcycle, you would know that the horn is controlled by the battery. So once the battery is depleted, the horn won't sound. This is deductive reasoning. To solve problems that common sense cannot solve, we need to continually alternate between inductive and deductive reasoning based on our observations and the regularities of things we have mastered. This process is what the author considers the scientific method. How do you alternate between them? Specifically, you can organize information by following six steps when solving a problem. 1. What is the problem to be solved? For example, motorcycle stalls. Two. What could be the possible causes of the problem? For example, potholes, carburetor blockage, low fuel level in the tank, burned ignition coil, broken pushrod, etc. Write them all down. 3. Based on the assumed causes, think about experiments to verify each one. 4. Predict the results of the experiments based on your current understanding of the regularities of things. 5. Observe the results of the experiments and see which one aligns with your predictions. 6. From the experimental results, draw conclusions and find the real cause of the motorcycle stalling. This process is similar to the methods used in laboratory experiments and research papers in many universities. However, our current goal is not just to complete assignments or write papers. It's about thinking accurately. The primary purpose of this scientific method is to allow us to accurately know the truth of things without going astray. Additionally, when thinking or solving problems, we may get stuck. For example, when repairing a motorcycle, you may have tried common methods before but couldn't fix it. Solving a math problem? 
You may get stuck halfway and can't think of a solution, at work, creating a plan. You may suddenly have no idea at a certain point, and so on. Here, the author teaches us not a specific method for solving these problems, but an important principle for dealing with being stuck. Firstly, it is important to view being stuck correctly. Many people feel that being stuck is terrible, but the author believes it's not. Instead, it's the best state. This is because many meditation practitioners adopt methods like meditation and adjusting their breathing to clear their minds and become an empty cup. When you are stuck, your mind is blank, and you are actually in this empty cup state. The methods you come up with in this state will far surpass those you think of with a mind full of distractions. So, as the author says, don't avoid being stuck. It is the state of mind before truly understanding. In the future, if you encounter being stuck or in a mental deadlock at work or in life, you can silently remind yourself of this sentence. Perhaps it can transform what was initially perceived as a dilemma into an opportunity for a breakthrough in thinking. Furthermore, the book mentions another principle, which is to always guard against rigidification of values. This helps us get out of the state of being stuck more quickly. The rigidification of values refers to adhering to old values, making it impossible to reassess things from a new perspective. For example, in the process of repairing a motorcycle, if you are convinced that the problem lies in the ignition coil and, after fumbling around there for a long time, you can't make progress, your thinking might get stuck. In this situation, if you want to find new clues, you need to temporarily abandon the old concept and shift your focus away from the ignition coil. If you persist in your original views, you cannot find the real answer, even if it is right in front of you. Here, the author tells a story about catching monkeys. When South American Indians catch monkeys, they first make a small hole at the top of a coconut, empty the inside, put some rice inside, and then tie the coconut to a wooden stick with a rope. The monkey, in order to get the rice, will insert its hand into the coconut. However, because the hole at the top of the coconut is small, once it grabs the rice, it's challenging to pull its hand out. This way, the villagers can easily catch it. This method works by exploiting the rigidification of values. The monkey is solely focused on the rice, overlooking that freedom is more important to it. Similarly, when we are trapped in the rigidification of values, we fall into a thinking trap similar to the monkeys. Therefore, the author suggests that when encountering difficulties in solving problems, you need to assess whether you have fallen into the rigidification of values, that is, whether you have been clinging to a certain mindset. If so, you need to slow down, re-examine whether the things you considered important in the past are still essential. In this process, you need to calm your mind, gaze silently at your problem, just like when fishing, silently watching the fishing line. Only when you calm down like this can you notice the subtle vibrations of the fishing line and perhaps encounter flashes of insight that you never noticed before. Okay, just now we were exploring with the author, experiencing his observations and thoughts during this journey. Next, let's turn inward, enter the entire book, and focus on a philosophical concept that the author values the most quality. Good quality, the essence of quality. In the book, the proposer of the concept of quality is a person named Phaedrus. You'll notice that. During the journey, the author occasionally recalls this person. He says Phaedrus is very wise but also very lonely, lacking close friends. He always travels alone. Many people around him find him cold and emotionless, but when it comes to pursuing truth, he is extremely passionate. Phaedrus spent a considerable amount of time and effort studying quality. This is a philosophy he created himself, not a formal professional term. From the book, we can see that Phaedrus attempted to find this quality from various thought systems, including astronomy, physics, philosophy, religion, and more. The author recorded these thought processes, interweaving them into almost half of the chapters in the book. So, what does this quality refer to? The book does not provide a clear definition of quality. More accurately, Phaedrus refuses to define quality. He believes that quality neither exists subjectively nor objectively. It does not belong to idealism or materialism. It is neither rational nor sensory. In summary, because he opposes these either slash or dualisms, he also opposes defining quality using any category from this dualistic world. He believes that it is an entity independent of the mind and matter, a third entity that emerges at the moment when subjectivity and objectivity intersect. In the author's recollections, after extensive philosophical speculation, Phaedrus eventually found that Laozi's concept of Tao in the Tao Te Ching could be considered an idea that communicates with quality. Laozi says in the Tao Te Ching, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. In other words, if you can articulate and explain the Tao, it is not the true Tao. In Phaedrus' view, clearly definable quality is also not absolute quality. In essence, he means that for the philosophical concept of quality, once we think we have explained it clearly, we have actually deviated from it. So, in today's interpretation, can we explore the connotation of quality? Yes, we can. 
Statistician George Box once said, All models are wrong, but some are useful. We can understand this statement as meaning that for each thing, there are countless interpretation models, each with its rationale, but none is complete or the ultimate answer. However, from another perspective, the more interpretation models you understand, the more sides of the thing you see, and the closer you get to the true nature of the thing. So, let me tell you about the main interpretations of quality that I currently see. Some people follow the concept of Tao mentioned earlier by Lousy and interpret quality as the source of everything, the beginning of all things, and the law governing the operation of the world. This interpretation makes sense because Phaedrus did mention that the quality he advocated is what is called Tao here, is the original power of all religions, is the source of all knowledge, the source of everything. Others follow the discussion in the book about the relationship between humans and technology and interpret quality as the key to people accepting and embracing technology. This interpretation also makes sense because, in Phaedrus' view, if a person can see quality and feel its existence, then they must be someone who cares. Those who resist technology do not want to care about technology and cannot perceive quality in technology. Quality and caring are interconnected. If the interpretations mentioned earlier are a bit confusing, it's okay. The next interpretation is more specific and easier to understand. Quality is seen as a pursuit of good that exists on both material and spiritual levels. More people support this interpretation. For example, the teacher he fan on our platform holds this understanding. Also, the English original word for quality is quality, directly translated as the meaning of quality. The addition of is the result of the Chinese translator's wording. Means good, which to some extent indicates that the Chinese translator also believes that quality is related to the pursuit of good. There is evidence for this interpretation in the book. For example, when discussing the quality of work, the author says, you must have a certain feeling for the quality of work, you must be able to judge what is good, and this will lead you forward. It is a direct result of your contact with basic reality, that is, quality. He also mentions a speech by U.S. President Truman. When talking about government plans, Truman said, we'll try. If these don't work, we'll try something else. In the author's view, Truman understands what quality is. If he doesn't like the status quo, he will seek better methods, unrestricted by dogmatism. The key here is better, and better is quality. So, how can we feel quality in work or life and achieve a state of better? First, you need to maintain inner calm. This may sound ordinary, but the author emphasizes that it's crucial. He has always kept a bicycle manual from Japan, which states, to assemble a Japanese-made bicycle, inner calm is needed first. The author says, maintaining inner calm is not a trivial matter in mechanical work. It is the core of the work. What can make you calm is advanced craftsmanship. Otherwise, it is low-level. Just like a seasoned motorcycle repairman, he won't follow the instructions in the product manual. He will focus entirely on the work at hand, making choices as he goes. There is a natural harmony between his actions and the machine. The machine in his hands will change along with his thoughts, eventually reaching a normal, calm state. For us, to do a good job at hand, we also need to let go of the pursuit of quick results, let go of the emotion of wanting to finish the work quickly, and simply focus on the task at hand, enjoying the process itself. This is an important meaning of inner calm as mentioned by the author. Besides inner calm, we also need to learn to care. Just now, we also mentioned that quality and caring are two sides of the same coin. The book believes that a person must have a caring attitude towards what they are doing to feel quality. For example, taking the repair of a motorcycle, in order to fix it, you study the construction of the motorcycle, learn the principles of mechanical power, and then find its symptoms for targeted repair, ultimately restoring the motorcycle to its original condition. The result of this process is excellent, but the process itself is not quality. It is because of your care for the motorcycle during the repair process, continuously improving repair skills, and constantly pursuing better results, that this state is an embodiment of quality. It's not just about repairing motorcycles. It's the same for anything. Like the book says, simply grinding a kitchen knife, sewing a piece of clothing, or repairing a broken chair, the underlying question is the same. You can do anything beautifully or ugly. Because of the guidance of quality, People can step by step towards improvement, turning what they are doing into an art. This process not only makes work less monotonous, but also makes you a more interesting person. This reminds me of a set of ideas from writer Daniel Pink in his book, Drive. He said that human motivation is divided into three types. The first motivation comes from basic survival needs. The second motivation comes from external rewards or punishments. The third motivation is internal drive, coming from the desire to do something well. If a person only has the first type, biological motivation, then they are not much different from animals. The second type of motivation, because it comes from external rewards or punishments, is beyond a person's control. So it often leads to frustration. 
Only the third type of motivation, internal drive, can allow a person to continuously experience a sense of satisfaction and joy. The quality mentioned in the book is very much like this third type of drive, internal drive. This kind of drive comes from your sincere care and liking for something. It allows you to immerse yourself in the process, in the joy of seeking better, whether it's learning, working, or doing small things like repairing motorcycles. What I just talked about, this part about internal drive, is a realization I had in the process of experiencing the concept of quality myself. As I mentioned earlier, one of the wonders of this book is that different people often come to different realizations about quality after reading it. I highly recommend you open the book yourself, read the philosophical speculation about quality inside, and discover your unique insights into quality. Okay, so far, we've covered the two threads in the book. The first thread explores outward, discussing the author's observations and thoughts during his motorcycle journey. The second thread delves inward, recounting the author's memories of Phaedrus, a person, and his concept of quality. In the latter part of the book, these two threads gradually merge. The author, traveling on the motorcycle, gradually realizes that Phaedrus is himself, the person he was before undergoing psychiatric treatment. In the process of exploring the concept of quality, he experienced a mental breakdown, underwent electroconvulsive therapy, and forgot his past. Phaedrus disappeared during treatment, but was gradually rediscovered during the journey. Therefore, this motorcycle journey can be seen as the author's journey of self-discovery. A brief note here. Although this book is presented as an autobiographical novel, the events and reflections inside are mostly derived from the author's real experiences. However, we shouldn't entirely equate the narrator, I, in the book with the actual author. For instance, the amnesia episode is an artistic device. In reality, the author underwent psychiatric treatment but did not experience amnesia. Now, let's take a look at the real-life experiences of the author, Robert Persick. He was exceptionally intelligent from a young age and entered university at the age of 15. Later, he joined the military, stationed in Korea, where he encountered Eastern philosophical thoughts. Subsequently, he studied Eastern philosophy in India and returned to the United States for further studies. In 1958, at the age of 30, he held a university position. However, despite his achievements, he was tormented by pain and depression. Through his experiences, he keenly felt the cultural divide between East and West and was troubled by Western dualistic concepts such as mind and matter, reason and sensibility, and subjectivity and objectivity. Thus, he continuously sought a method to bridge this divided binary world. The quality we mentioned earlier is a philosophical concept he constructed during this process. While grappling with these thoughts, he developed paranoid schizophrenia and clinical depression. Starting from 1963, he underwent electroconvulsive therapy, in which doctors introduced alternating high-voltage electricity into his brain for 28 consecutive sessions, each lasting 0.5 to 1.5 seconds. This process killed his former self, the Phaedrus mentioned in the book. The name Phaedrus comes from Plato's Dialogues, where Phaedrus is a philosophical and expressive young man from Athens. In the book, the author mentions that in Greek, Phaedrus means wolf. However, in the author's notes in the 25th anniversary edition of the book, he corrected this mistake. The true meaning of Phaedrus is extremely wise or radiant. The author later explained that in the book, Phaedrus and the narrator, I, during the journey, are two minds vying for the same body. These two minds have different value choices regarding what is important in life. Phaedrus is a person dominated by the value of knowledge. He doesn't care whether others like him or not. He is single-mindedly pursuing what he deems important truths. However, this is not understood by mainstream society, leading to his elimination from society. On the other hand, the narrator, I, in the book is a person controlled by mainstream societal values. Having learned from Phaedrus's lesson, he doesn't want to undergo electroconvulsive therapy again, avoiding isolation from society. Hence, many of his thoughts are only written in this book and not shared with his traveling companion, his son, the Sutherlands, or anyone else. In Phaedrus's eyes, the narrator is a coward who abandons the truth in exchange for societal acceptance. However, fragments of Phaedrus's thoughts still linger in the narrator's mind, leading to internal conflicts. Throughout the 18-day motorcycle journey, Phaedrus in the author's mind struggles against the narrator's weakness. The author's son, Chris, also seeks the father he remembers. During the journey, as the author gradually picks up the fragments of his past thoughts and engages in conversations with his son, the upright Phaedrus finally triumphs over the evading narrator. In the end, Chris asks the author, were you really insane back then? The answer comes not from the narrator but from Phaedrus. Chris knows that this is the first time during the entire journey that he's conversing again with his long-lost father. The internal conflict between the two minds within the author's body finally disappears. Things are slowly getting better, Phaedrus says. 
We can almost expect it. Okay, up to now, we've covered the key contents of this book through three threads. The theme of the first thread is physical and mental journey. Along this thread, we explore outward, accompanying the author through the countryside, traversing forests, feeling the clear wind on mountaintops, and the streams and valleys. Simultaneously, we gather various observations during the journey, contemplating aspects of self and the external world. This includes perspectives on the relationship between humans and technology, applying scientific methods to problem-solving, and dealing with mental blocks. The theme of the second thread is intellectual exploration. Along this thread, we inquire within and outline the most important philosophical exploration in the book, the concept of quality. It's not a rigorous philosophical theory, and the author isn't trying to preach any principles. It's simply a record of his reflections on past thoughts. He believes that Western dualism, dividing everything into categories like mind and matter, subjectivity and objectivity, and reason and sensibility, is incorrect. It's akin to the idea that when people admire scenery, they and the scenery are not separate. When working, they and the work are not in opposition. Quality, in the author's view, is a philosophical concept attempting to bridge these dualistic worlds. He argues that only when individuals are internally calm and genuinely care about what they are doing can they perceive quality, reaching a better state. The theme of the third thread is self-discovery. Along this thread, we combine the previous two threads and see that during the journey, the two minds within the author's being are in constant struggle. Ultimately, Phaedrus, who courageously seeks the truth, triumphs over the accommodating narrator, completing the return to the true self. In addition to these, if we step outside the book itself, we can see a fourth thread this book carrying the unique culture of an era. As mentioned earlier, this journey took place in 1968, a tumultuous period in the United States. Amid the Vietnam War's influence, anti-war sentiments were rising domestically. Simultaneously, minority races emerged as significant political forces in American society. Beneath the facade of prosperity, issues of poverty and inequality became increasingly prominent. Faced with internal and external challenges and a society in chaotic values, many American youths began to resist mainstream society, rationalism, and materialistic values, pursuing peace, freedom, and a return to simplicity. Thus, in literature, there emerged the beat generation, represented by Kerouac and Ginsburg, and in popular culture, the hippie movement and road movies, among others. This book was born against this backdrop. It advocates quality, opposing materialism and secular standards of success such as fame and fortune. However, it transcends the nihilistic freedom of the hippies in a positive direction. People can feel a positive direction and quality, a pursuit of the good, which is worth striving for. So, in that era, it became a benchmark of the new culture and was well received. Okay, if after listening to today's interpretation, you've developed an interest in opening this book and exploring it yourself, I highly recommend clicking on the ebook at the end of the audiobook manuscript to personally experience its philosophy and scenery. If you find it challenging or difficult to draw definite conclusions during your reading, don't be discouraged. In the book, the author depicts the spiritual growth of humans as a mountain climb. He says that there isn't a singular or fixed route for climbing a mountain, and as many people climb the mountain, there are as many paths. During the climb, your pace should be determined by your own condition, and don't be in a hurry. With each step, don't always think about reaching the summit. Learn to enjoy the discoveries along the way. For example, here are serrated leaves, a loose rock here, a view of snow on the mountaintop, and so on. These are all noteworthy things. Like the book says, living only for some future goal is shallow. Life converges in the mountains for sides, not at the summit. Our footprints are the place where everything grows. Okay, that's it for today on Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom and practice, achieve our financial goals, and create a better future together. Thank you, everyone, goodbye.